you. Okay. Morton A. Klein is the national president of the Zionist Organization of America, ZOA, the oldest pro-Israel group in the United States, founded in 1897. He is also a member of the National Council of APAC. He is a child of survivors born in a displaced persons camp in Gunzburg, Germany. Mr. Klein is an economist who served in the Nixon, Ford, and Carter administrations. Mort Klein has been named one of the top Jewish activists of the century, one of the top 10 Jewish leaders who have made a difference, and one of the best minds in the country. Quoting from the Wall Street Journal, a man who, I'm sorry, when the history of the American Jewish struggle in these years is written, Mr. Klein will emerge as an outsized figure. And the New York Times calls Klein, a man who ferrets out anti-Semitism wherever it is, a rare voice from the onset in the American Jewish community against the Oslo Accords, and an iconoclast who is a prolific speechmaker, writer, and congressional lobbyist. His successful campaigns against anti-Israel bias in leading college and high school textbooks, travel guides, universities, churches, and the media, as well as his work on Capitol Hill, were the subject of 30 feature stories. He has been invited to testify before Congress and the Israeli Knesset. Mr. Klein is quoted internationally, and more than 300 of his articles and letters have been published around the world. He has appeared on every major television network. And so I am incredibly honored to introduce the man who many consider to be, quoting from the Times of Israel, America's most important Jew, Morton A. Klein. Well, thank you so much, uh, Lauren, and thank you so much for the wonderful welcome uh, that you've given me. <laughs> uh, Lauren read those words, by the way, exactly the way I wrote them, and I appreciate that. <laughs> um, <laughs> by, by the way, I was one of the people uh, who was in the room when Ron DeSantis uh, signed that legislation in Israel. I, I was one of the people who went with him. I've known Governor DeSantis for many, many years, throughout all his time in Congress, and I can tell you, Co Governor DeSantis is the best friend of Israel of any public figure I ever met. <laughs> <laughs> Closer. <laughs> All right, I'll try to hold it. Is that better? <laughs> Even though I've been doing this for 29 years, I'm a nervous wreck before every speech, including now. <laughs> I don't know why all you people are not having brunch somewhere and enjoying yourself. <laughs> Jerry Seinfeld once said that there were polls showing, uh, asking people, what do they fear most? <laughs> and uh, uh, what they feared most was public speaking. It was, uh, what they feared most uh, was public speaking. Number two was fear of dying. Public speaking, this is, this is true, was public speaking. Number two is fear of dying. And Seinfeld said, that means the next time you're at a funeral, it means the person giving the eulogy wishes he was in the casket. <laughs> I know just how that fellow feels. <laughs> My wife who's here has always instructed me to inform people. Uh, since age five, uh, I've had Tourette syndrome, a neurochemical disorder that makes me make sounds I can't control, facial tics. Uh, uh, my father, who was a, a great Talmudic scholar, also had Tourette, and uh, so this is where I got it from, was my father. And my father, as I said, was a great Talmudic scholar. My brother uh, uh, is a professor of medicine at Washington University St. Louis Med School, and Sammy said, it's fair, you got one of his traits, I got one of his traits. 
<laughs> no, he got the brains. <laughs> Uh, but I have a mild form. The, the, worst, the worst form of Tourette is cursing for no reason whatsoever, as you may know. Uh, and I have to tell you, every time I curse, it's for a damn good reason. <laughs> so, <laughs> I could do a whole thing on Tourette. Maybe I, I should. It's much more fun. <laughs> there are positives and negatives to Tourette. <laughs> The positive, and this is true, Tourette people have a slightly higher IQ than people without Tourette. That's the positive. The negative is people with Tourette have far fewer dates in high school and college. <laughs> I think it's enough with the Tourette. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> uh, um, anyhow, we're the oldest pro-Israel group. We have a government relations division. We have lobbyists on Capitol Hill. Uh, we have a campus division in about 100 campuses. We have a Center for Law and Justice. It is ZOA that got Title VI of the Civil Rights Act changed to include Jewish people. It only included other minorities. We got it changed to include Jews. <laughs> <laughs> and I might tell you, we begged every major group to join us to try and help us to change it. None of them would do it. They didn't want to make waves, they would not do it. Only until the very end when it looked like we were going to get a change, which we did, only then did these other groups join in uh, because they wanted to get partial credit, which they didn't deserve. <laughs> we have filed more Title VI legal cases against uh, high schools and universities than any other group. <laughs> we have uh, cases right now against the Fairfax Public School District. Students in the halls are screaming Heil Hitler, making anti-Semitic jokes, sending text anti-Semitic text to students, there's swastikas all over the place, without any effort to try and change this. We have sued them under Title VI that they've got to respond to this under the law. <laughs> Cooney law, City University Law School has a student who put out videos saying she will put on fire any person who wears an IDF shirt. We demanded she be thrown out of school as a law student. They've refused. Instead, Cooney Law School made her a commencement speaker. Yes, a commencement speaker. Instead of throwing her out, and she got a standing ovation for her speech. These are the problems we have in universities. And we have Jewish board members at these universities who do nothing. We tried to reach out to them. They want to remain comfortably on their board. They don't want to do anything. It's a real problem. Uh, Newark, New Jersey School District uh, uh, uses an anti-Semitic uh, book called Little Piece of, of, uh, of Ground, uh, teaching horrible lies against Israel. They're an evil oppressor. They, they murder babies unintentionally. So this is Newark, New Jersey. So black kids are learning to hate Israel based on lies. We're trying to get rid of this book. We've talked to the governor personally. He says he doesn't have jurisdiction over this. I, you know, make a speech, scream about it, embarrass them. <laughs> so we're trying to get something done in this and, and many, many other uh, lawsuits as well. <laughs> um, I always like to show this map because it's as important as anything. There are 22 Arab states. The, the orange countries are the 22 Arab states. The little yellow you see in the center is Israel. Israel's actually smaller than what you're looking at because Israel's given away parts of that yellow, Gaza and parts of uh, uh, Judea and Samaria. Uh, so uh, the Arab world is 800 times the size of Israel. Uh, uh, and the world is saying the way you get to peace is land for peace. And who are they asking to give up land? Uh, and, and Israel's already, of course, we all know offered land. We'll talk about that in a second. Uh, uh, and, and it doesn't work. <laughs> By a show of hands, how many people here have heard uh, uh, that their complaints that Israel is now elected a far-right extremist government? How many have heard that? You've heard that? You've all heard that. <laughs> this is unbelievable. <laughs> and almost every Jewish group ADL, AJ Committee, I'm naming names, have publicly condemned this extremist government before they've done anything. I just wrote an op-ed in the Jerusalem Post about the proposals of this government, not anything that they finalized. There's nothing extreme. Let me just tell you, I think it's important to talk about before I get into the main part of my speech. 
uh, this extremist government uh, is asking uh, for the death penalty for con convicted murderers, like we have in America in many states. Uh, they're asking uh, to deport Palestinian terrorists after they serve their sentence in prison. If you're a Palestinian terrorist, you're thrown out of the country after that. Is that extreme? <laughs> the Temple Mount, Judaism's holiest place, where there's a mosque that they built intentionally in the Temple Mount to show superiority to our temple that was there. That's why it's called the Temple Mount. Notice it's not called the Mosque Mount. This is where our temples were. <laughs> and this new government says, Muslims can pray on the Temple Mount. Shouldn't Jews be allowed to pray in the Temple Mount if they wish? That's all they're asking. <laughs> and they also want to give police and the IDF less restrictions in defending Jews against Arab terrorists. Less restrictions. <laughs> this is important. Their, their hands are tied in many cases. And Israel's not America. Israel has a horrible problem of Arab terrorism attacking innocent Jews. There are seven terrorist attacks in Israel every single day for the past year, seven a day. So Israel has a peculiarly difficult situation and they deserve, they need to give more strength and power to police to protect our people. <laughs> and, and there's also been an uproar about changing the rules of how you become uh, an automatic citizen. <laughs> When Israel was created, they, they, the, the law said anyone who's a Jew can automatically become a citizen of Israel. In 1970, that was changed to say if you have one grandparent who's Jewish, you can automatically become a citizen. They want to change this, that only if you have one parent who's, who's a Jew, you can be a citizen, not one grandparent. And why do they want to change this? Why does this make sense? From Russia, 500,000 people who come from Russia to Israel are not Jewish. 500,000. 72% of the people who've come from Russia to Israel are not Jews. Only 10% of them convert. That's it. They have no interest in Judaism. Of those people who moved to Israel last year, over 50% were not Jewish. Over 50% of the people who moved to Israel were not Jewish. <laughs> we're losing 1% of the majority population of Israel every three years. 30 years ago, we had 84% of Israel was Jewish. Today, it's 74%. It's dropped by 10%. If this keeps going, we soon will not have a Jewish majority in Israel. This is a real problem because non-Jews who don't care about Israel as a Jewish state are now already influencing laws, leadership, and security issues. Even Ehud Barak, in 1999, when he ran against Netanyahu, he won that election. Bibi Netanyahu won the Jewish vote. The non-Jewish vote gave the prime ministership to Ehud Barak. And Israel is not a little America. Israel is created as a Jewish state for Jews with all rights for non-Jews. But this is a Jewish state. It's not a little America. And we have to remember that. <laughs> by, uh, by the way, uh, uh, invoking this extreme proposal uh, doesn't change the definition of who is a Jew of any religious Jewish stream. And it has no impact on American Jews. Uh, uh, in the last 10 years, only 67 non-Jews came to Israel under uh, having one grandparent. It doesn't affect American Jews. <laughs> so it is ridiculous to be screaming against this. We're trying to keep Israel to remain a, the one and only tiny little Jewish state. That's all this is. <laughs> and I must also mention something. I didn't intend to speak about this, but there's been such an uproar about this government, which was, by the way, democratically elected in a landslide. They have 64 seats compared to 46 seats for the opposition, not including the Arab parties. It was a landslide. Uh, the Jews are getting sick and tired of certain policies in Israel, and they want change. Uh, one of the big changes they want uh, is the Supreme Court. You've heard about they want changes. Uh, and people are screaming, this will end democracy, this will destroy Israel, this will destroy the economy. It's unbelievable. Uh, I even just had a fight this week with my, my friend Alan Dershowitz, who's complaining about this. Uh, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, so what's the deal with that? 
How are the Supreme Court justices chosen? Here in America, uh, the president chooses, Republican or Democrat, and it has to be confirmed by the Senate, uh, which gives a little, uh, uh, a bit, it, it makes it a little harder to have real extreme people get on the court, and it's really political. <laughs> in Israel, uh, there's a committee, three Supreme Court justices, two cabinet ministers, two Knesset members, two bar associate members. Uh, you need seven of those nine to approve a Supreme Court justice, which means the three Supreme Court justices have veto power. So the very liberal Israeli Supreme Court can veto any one right of center they don't like. And that's why you have a very left-wing Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court now, and so they want to change that to make it a little harder for the sitting justices to decide who should be in the Supreme Court. We wouldn't want the Supreme Court justices in America to decide who the next justice is. We want it to be a president with approval of the Senate. I think that's a much better system. The Supreme Court in Israel can overturn any Knesset law, not based on statutory law, not based on law. <coughs> they have this new concept. They, uh, Aaron Barak, the former Supreme Court justice, came saying it's called reasonableness. So if the Supreme Court says the law of the Knesset pay, passed is not reasonable to us, we're throwing it out. They, they don't have to base it on any law. They just say, we don't like it. It's not reasonable. It's outrageous. And what's reasonable to one person isn't reasonable to another. <laughs> so that's why they want to change it so this is not possible. They want to have an override where at least 61 of the 120 members of the Supreme Court can overrule a Supreme Court decision. And it's very hard to get 61. And if people don't like 61, make it 65. But we should not allow the Supreme Court to be overruling based on reasonableness. That's what's happening. <laughs> and let me just give you a few examples to show you how serious this is. Based on reasonableness, the Supreme Court <laughs> has overlooked basic Israeli law, says if you're a racist or sympathize for terrorism, you can't be in the Knesset. So they initially threw out two Arab parties and a communist party that fulfilled that, their treasonous parties. The Supreme Court overruled it and said that's not reasonable. We want them in. That's why Ra'am is in the, in the Israeli government. That's why the Israel Communist Party still exists. They overruled a law in, in, in Israel. The Lebanon deal. Israel just made a Lebanon deal where they gave away 300 square miles of area in, in the sea. Most of the gas, gas rights, a huge amount of money. And this deal under law cannot be passed without a majority of the Knesset passing it and a referendum or two thirds of the Knesset. Lapid ignored this and said, no, this is what we want, we're doing it. And he took it to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court ruled, you don't have to worry about the Knesset or referendum, it's okay. Against you, Israeli law, that's why people are so upset. <laughs> Israel has a law, if you're an activist, promoter of boycotting Israel, you can't come to Israel. Supreme Court said, yes, you can. Supreme Court said, yes, you can. <laughs> Uh, there are terrorist buildings that the, the Knesset wanted to knock down because they're being used to murder Israelis in the roads. There are, there are terrorists in these buildings. The Knesset passed, let's knock these buildings down so they can't hide in these buildings anymore. The Supreme Court said, it's not reasonable. You can't knock them down. <laughs> and I give you, uh, and the last one I'll mention is illegal immigration. Israel has, wants to stop and deport people who've come to Israel illegally, as they should, uh, and the Supreme Court said, no, it's not reasonable. So uh, this and many other uh, reasons is why there's a move to change the rules about the Supreme Court. None of the rules are extreme. It's to make it more fair and more uh, uh, representative of the Israeli people according to their Knesset members who are elected. Uh, so all this stuff about extreme uh, Israel, extreme the far right, extreme government, it's utter nonsense. It's utter nonsense. There's nothing there that I have found uh, inappropriate in any way, shape, or form. Uh, and, and yet, we've had uh, uh, it, the major Jewish organizations publicly condemning Israel, saying, don't you dare do anything too extreme. Uh, we're very concerned about uh, these far right-wing people. Did these same Jewish leaders complain about Ra'am, a far-left anti-Israel party in the government last year, or Meretz, an extremist left-wing party in the government la uh, last time? No, they said not one word. Uh, only now uh, are they speaking out. <laughs> and we have a problem with Jewish leadership. Uh, Jewish leaders do not tell the truth 
or, or any speeches about Jerusalem, settlements, occupation. Uh, Mahmoud Abbas is a prime minister. I think if more people knew the truth about these issues, uh, you'd have less hatred on Israel on campuses if they knew the truth, and you'd have less anti-Semitism. Part of anti-Semitism, in part, uh, is hatred of the Jewish state based on falsehoods. Uh, uh, for example, Jerusalem. <laughs> what is the truth about Jerusalem? Is Jerusalem holy to Muslims? <laughs> well, you all know that. I can leave. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Jerusalem was the capital of Israel under King David 3,000 years ago. Never the capital of any other nation except Israel. When the Arabs conquered Palestine in 716, they made Ramla their capital, not Jerusalem. It's called the Temple Mount, not the Mosque Mount. The majority of people living in Jerusalem since the mid-1800s, the first census, have been Jews. Jews were the majority. In a 1906 uh, travel guide to Jerusalem that I own, it said that out of 60,000 people in Jerusalem then, 13,000 were Christian, 7,000 Muslims, 40,000 were Jews. Uh, overwhelming majority of people in Jerusalem have always been Jews. The Jewish holy books, as many of you know, 700 times mention Jerusalem. It is never mentioned in the Koran. If it's so damn holy to the Muslims, why isn't it in their holy book? I want to know. So you know what they say when I wrote an op-ed about this? Yes, I wrote an op-ed about this in the Washington Post. <laughs> And, they, and I was attacked with seven letters they published attacking me, saying, well, Muhammad went from Jerusalem to heaven. This is why it's holy to us. Muhammad, our pro great prophet. <laughs> well, did he go from Jerusalem to heaven? First of all, when it's written in the Koran, as I've read, <laughs> about Muhammad going to heaven, it was a dream, first of all. It didn't happen. It was a dream. <laughs> I have many dreams. I'm grateful that most of what I dream about never happened and never will happen. <laughs> so, and what does the uh, what does the Quran say? It says he went from the furthest mosque to heaven. Well, first of all, why doesn't it say Jerusalem? It's a famous city. No, it says the furthest mosque. So, how do we know that can't be Jerusalem? Because there wasn't a single mosque in Israel in Palestine when the Koran was written. So it cannot be, uh, be Jerusalem. It's a total lie. Muhammad, in a dream or not a dream, never went from Jerusalem to heaven. Uh, we face Jerusalem when we pray, the Muslims face Mecca. And when they controlled Jerusalem from 48 to 67, when Jordan the Arabs controlled it, uh, they allowed it to be a slum. There was virtually no water, electricity, or plumbing. They destroyed the 58 synagogues there. They destroyed the Mount of Olives Jewish cemetery. No Arab leader except the, the heads of Jordan ever came to Jerusalem when they controlled it. If it's so holy, why aren't they showing up and praying there? So we have to start making it clear. We're not discussing Jerusalem. We're not negotiating. We're not giving a sentiment to Jerusalem because it's not yours. It is Jewish. <laughs> you know, when I gave an entire speech on Jerusalem in Los Angeles, uh, with Rabbi David Wolpe's synagogue, a major synagogue. I gave an entire speech about it, and I got a very strong positive response. And Rabbi Wolpe got up and said, Mort, I'm not happy with this speech. I don't want you telling Muslims what's holy to them. I don't want them telling you, us what's holy to us. And I took the microphone and I said, uh, well, David, if tomorrow they say Los Angeles is holy to us, do we have to give them Beverly Hills and Brentwood? <laughs> That was, I don't care what they say. I care if it's true. If they can prove LA is holy to them, then we got to deal with it. If they can prove Jerusalem is holy to them, we have to deal with it, but it's not holy to them. This is a lie, and we have to speak out. And <laughs> <laughs> Settlements. People are screaming about settlements. Israel's building all over the place. 90% of, of, of Judea and Samaria, the West Bank, is filled with settlements. They're building on relent, relentlessly. <laughs> They're making it impossible for any possible Palestinian state, which I'll talk about. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, not a single new significant settlement has been built since Oslo was signed in 1993. None. There aren't any additional settlements. Uh, the Jewish communities in Judea and Samaria comprise only 3% of all Judea and Samaria. That's it. 3%. <laughs> and, uh, and the Arabs, oh, by the way, if there's a peace agreement, there'd be a border, then they could build beyond it. Uh, but, uh, but they don't want to uh, deal with it. By the way, Article 24 in the PLO Covenant uh, says... 
The PLO does not exercise any territorial sovereignty over the West Bank or the Gaza Strip. How do you like that? Article 24, the Arabs themselves say, this is not our area. <laughs> and yet Tom Nides, this terrible U.S. ambassador to Israel, a Jewish man, <laughs> says, I will not go and visit any community in Judea and Samaria. I won't visit any Jew who lives there. I'm not going to Ephrat, Arael, or Mal Damim. But he has no problem going to Ramallah or Janin and visiting with terrorist Arabs who pay people to murder us. That's okay with him. We have to scream about Thomas Nides. I might tell you, every single appointment made by this administration <laughs> that affects Israel is someone hostile to Israel, without uh, exception. <laughs> and I, I might tell you, every one of these appointments is a close friend of Barack Hussein Obama's. So I wonder who's really <laughs> making these decisions. <laughs> I won't even get into the apartheid slur. You all know uh, uh, Arabs have all the same rights as, as Israelis uh, uh, in, in voting, uh, in going to school. Uh, uh, they're ambassadors, they're, uh, they work in hospitals, they're students in all the universities. This is one of the uh, extraordinary slurs is apartheid. I won't even get into it. You know, it's just completely absurd. <laughs> the occupation. <laughs> All we hear about is end the occupation, end the occupation. We can't take it anymore. We've got to end this occupation. Ladies and gentlemen, is there really an occupation? An occupation means <laughs> you have illegally stolen someone else's sovereign land. That would be occupation. <laughs> this was never... Uh, uh, Arab sovereign land. In 1917, the British legally controlled this after World War I, and they gave, uh, 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 they gave uh, all of what was in Palestine to the Jews in the Balfour Declaration. Uh, unfortunately, in 1922, they gave away 78% of original Palestine to Jordan. It was Transjordan then. <laughs> in 1948, uh, it, uh, Britain, which controlled this land, uh, split the rest of Palestine, only 23% left, essentially in half, uh, gave half to the Jews, half to the Palestinian Arabs for two states. That was a, two -state, a real two-state solution, and the Arabs said no. <laughs> and they went to war to destroy Israel and kill all the Jews uh, as, as best they could. <laughs> uh, 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 had they accepted it, they already would have had a state. So Israel is simply on land that was given to them under many, many uh, legal uh, 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 resolutions, the San Remo Resolution, the League of Nations, and many, many others. <laughs> uh, and also, by the way, <laughs> the word Palestine is not even an Arab name. It's a Roman name. If this is Arab land, the West Bank, Palestine, why does it have a Roman name? Why don't they name it after a Roman name? <laughs> because the Romans renamed it when they captured it from the Jews. They named it after the Palestinians, who were the Jews' arch enemy, to stick it to the Jews. Arabs can't even pronounce the letter P. They can't even say Palestine. They say Palestine. They can't say the P. So this has never been an Arab land, never been an Arab country. And so, of course, there's no occupation, not to mention Israel gave away 40% of Judea and Samaria, the West Bank, to the Arabs, 100% of Gaza. That's where 99% of the Palestinian Arabs live under their own rule. They have their own parliament, schools, textbooks, newspapers, radio and TV, businesses, and a police force. They run their own lives. Yes, we have checkpoints because Arabs continue to come into Israel to want to murder Jews as we saw this tragedy that just happened several days ago. <laughs> so there will be checkpoints as long as there's Arab terrorism just as we have checkpoints at every airport where we travel. We go through a checkpoint, and we do that because of Islamic terrorism. We have to keep that in mind. It's not general, it's not, it's not Oslo terrorism, or Swedish terrorism, or European terrorism. It's largely because of Muslim Arab terrorism is why we have checkpoints at airports. <laughs> and that will all end <coughs> when terrorism ends, those, those sorts of checkpoints. <laughs> <laughs> the myth of refugees, the Palestinian Arabs say there's five million refugees who want them to come to Israel. How is there five million refugees from 1948? Because it's the only refugee population where they include the children refugees, the grandchildren, the great-grandchildren. That's how you get to five million. Of the actual refugees, 
uh, from 1948, there's only 30,000 left. That's it. And there would not be a single Arab refugee if six Arab nations had not invaded Israel. It is the fault of the Palestinian Arabs that they're refugees. They should resolve the problem, not Israel. <laughs> And I love how they say, we don't want to live under Israeli rule. You're occupying us. We don't want to live under your rule. And yet they're demanding that millions of Arabs move into Israel under Israeli rule. <laughs> because the goal is not bringing them into Israel per se. It's to end Israel as a Jewish state. That's the only reason they continue this refugee issue to destroy Israel. <laughs> and Mahmoud Abbas. When we, I speak on college campuses, people think Abbas is a peacemaker who just wants a little Palestinian state for the Arabs. What is the truth of Mahmoud Abbas? And by the way, the things I'm talking about, you know, we don't have Jewish leaders saying these things. We don't have rabbis saying these things. Mahmoud Abbas is a Holocaust denier, wrote his PhD thesis denying the Holocaust. Mahmoud Abbas says, no Jew will be allowed to live in any future Palestinian state. He says, Jews are great liars, fakers of history. He glorifies Jew-killing terrorists when they die with big parades. <laughs> he names schools, streets, sports teams, and tournaments after Jew-killing terrorists, honoring them. He visits them at their homes, parents of, of terrorists who have died. He visits them and honors them. <laughs> and he pays Arabs a lifetime pension to murder Jews. And the pension is five times the average salary of a Palestinian. It is very lucrative to murder a Jew. He spends $450 million a year paying Arabs to murder Jews. And Trump, President, previous President Trump said, as long as you pay Arabs to murder Jews, we're cutting off the $500 million we give you. <laughs> and all Trump asked, all Trump asked was, stop paying Arabs to murder Jews, we'll reinstate the $500 million. And Abbas says, no, these are holy martyrs and we will never stop paying them for the holy work that they do, said Abbas. And what did this administration do? They reinstated not only 500 million, they give them 800 million a year to the Palestinian Authority and 700 million to UNRWA, which teaches small Arab children to hate Jews and to kill Jews. We now fund this, we help them. What is wrong with us? Imagine if Israel paid Jews to murder Arabs. The world would go out of their minds as they should. <laughs> Yet that's what's happening in mean, the Palestinian Authority and not, um, virtually and not really nothing is done about it. They're ignoring uh, 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 the Taylor Force Act which forces uh, par, uh, part of this money to be, to, to be cut. Uh, <laughs> so uh, 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 Mahmoud Abbas makes his speeches saying things like, the Jews have no right to defile our Temple Mount with their filthy feet. <laughs> On, Arab, on PATV, they show Muslim imams preaching how to kill Jews with knives. They show cars, how the cars can run into Jews and kill them. Uh, Arabs are riled up and motivated by Palestinian Arabs proclaiming that Israel is killing babies. Israelis are coming to the mosque to destroy it. Uh, this is extraordinary motivation and incitement to get Arabs to murder Jews. They pay them and they teach them that Jews are the scum of the earth and they're worthy of being killed. <laughs> so in this horrible Arab Nazi murdered seven innocent Jews coming out of shul and injured 10 others. And people say he was a lone gunman. Ladies and gentlemen, he was not a lone gunman. The entire culture he comes from teaches him that it's good to murder Jews, it's an honor to murder Jews, and, that's, and he gets paid to murder Jews as well. <laughs> he sees posters like this. Of every Arab who murders a Jew gets posters made of him and put in all the mosques, high schools, and, and universities in the Palestinian Authority honoring them. This is one of the uh, Jew killers uh, uh, that they honor with these, by, these, by the hundreds that have these posters. <laughs> and what did Mahmoud Abbas choose as his uh, uh, emblem for the Palestinian Authority? A picture of all of Israel with an Arab kafir over all of it a picture of Arafat in the center with a Kalishnikov rifle. Is this the emblem that an entity uses if they want to make peace with the Jewish state of Israel? And yet, no one, almost no one knows about this emblem. Where's the front page articles in the New York Times? Where are our rabbis and Jewish leaders screaming about this emblem, really day and night, in addition to the fact that they pay people to murder Jews? 
And I will say this, where are Israeli leaders? They're not screaming about uh, uh, paying Arabs to murder Jews. This emblem, uh, the live occupation, Jerusalem is not theirs. I want to hear this uh, from uh, our leaders. I'm not hearing this. (laughs) And the textbooks uh, that this man studied uh, teach uh, has headline articles uh, such as Jews are evil, Jews are the Zionist enemy, Jews are fanatics, Jews kill Muslims and Christians, Jews are treacherous, Uh, Jews want to destroy the Al-Aqsa Mosque, Jews are members of the prophets, Jews foment wars, Jews are evil racists, Zionism and Nazism is the biggest racist movements of the 20th century. This is what they learn in school. They're inspired to do a holy act, a mitzvah to murder Jews, and we say nothing about this. And on television, they have interviews with beautiful Arab children. The interviewer is saying to a beautiful Arab girl, you describe martyrdom, that means suicide bombing, as something beautiful. Do you think it's beautiful? Yes, says the beautiful Arab girl. Martyrdom is very beautiful. Everybody wants to be a martyr. What can be better than going to paradise? Interviewer, what is better, peace and full rights for the Palestinian people or martyrdom? Martyrdom, she says. I will achieve my rights after I become a martyr. (laughs) This is one picture of the beautiful Arab girl. The quote, what could be better than going to paradise? They teach Arab children to hate, kill, and maim Jews. This is part of their everyday culture. It should be no shock that there are seven Arab Nazi attacks every day against Jews. This is what they learn. They're honored for it. (laughs) And our Jewish leaders don't make an issue out of this. And, and this is really a terrible problem. <laughs> there was actually an article, rare, in the New York Times by the editor who visited a family of a suicide bomber. And he was shocked to hear, he wrote this, the bomber's mother, the, the murderer's mother said, I was very happy when I heard about my son's suicide bombing. To be a martyr, that's something. Very few people can do it. I hope my other children do the same. This is a mother. So when Shimon Perez says, Mort, Arab mothers want the same for their children as Jewish mothers. No, they don't, Mr. Perez. It's not true. (laughs) He goes on the right. The the house was filled. There's a celebration when this suicide bomber died. The house was filled with supportive neighbors bringing over casseroles. The bomber's 11-year-old sister basked in the sudden attention of classmates who told her how lucky she is to have a martyr for a brother. The bomber's mother speaks of the 72 virgins and the friends of the Prophet Muhammad awaiting her son in paradise. They renamed the local school after her son. (laughs) They take out newspaper ads to commemorate these bombings. They make announcements like weddings. People don't know this. This is a hideous culture, a monstrous, murderous culture, teaching people to murder us and hate us based on lies. And I don't see this in the Jewish papers. I don't hear rabbi sermons, Jewish leaders, or Israeli leaders screaming about how monstrous this is. We have to reduce sympathy and empathy for the Palestinian Authority and its leaders. They are monsters. And we have to make that clear. And we haven't done that at all. Instead, the newspaper make it look like the Israeli government are extreme and monstrous and horrible and anti-peace. That's all I read about now, as you all agreed, how extreme this new government is. They never write about how extreme and monstrous the Abbas government really is. And because of all this, in polls, 90% of Palestinian youth are against Israel's right to exist. 90% and 73% support murdering every Jew, their own polls. Right? This, is, this is the culture that we're dealing with. <laughs> and finally, a Palestinian state. Give them a state. I hear this in Congress all the time. Uh, uh, APAC is supporting a two-state solution, uh, AJ Committee, ADL, but they're all supporting a two-state solution, which is a myth. Israel's already a state, so it's a Palestinian state solution. Uh, will the Palestinian state resolve it? Uh, first of all, they were offered a state in 1937-47, 2000-2008. They were offered a state every time. Uh, they turned it down every time uh, without a counteroffer. Uh, and they don't want a state. In fact, when Ehud Olmert offered them this incredible deal in 2008, 97% of Judean Samaria, 3% of Israel proper to make up for the 3% they didn't get, half of Jerusalem, billions of dollars in aid, and Abbas wouldn't take it. And I called up Olmert, and I said, Mr. Prime Minister, 
This is a monstrous deal you offered them. I wrote articles attacking you, but they didn't take it. Mort, I read your articles. Believe me, it gave me heartburn. <laughs> Why didn't Abbas take your deal? I don't get it. Mort, he said to me, I got to eliminate three clauses in the deal. In the deal. <laughs> One, that I accept Israel as a Jewish state. Abbas said, I, I will never sign that. <laughs> Two, that I can't bring as many refugees, so-called refugees as I want, into Israel. He said, I won't sign that. Three, I won't sign that has a clause, no further claims. No, but if you're making this deal with these extraordinary concessions, of course it's over, no further claims. He said, I won't sign no further claims. What more proof do you need after they're being offered a state eight times in the last 80 years, four times in the last 20 years, that the issue is not land and statehood. It's Israel's very existence. They want Israel destroyed and they want to kill the Jews. It has nothing to do with statehood. So stop, Mr. and Mrs. Uh, uh, Jewish organizational leader, Mr. and Mrs. Congressperson, stop screaming about a Palestinian state solution. They won't take it uh, under any circumstances because that's not the issue. <laughs> 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 but we Jews can have confidence that the future with all the problems will be brighter. We Jews arose from the onslaughts throughout the Middle Ages from pogroms in the 1800s. We miraculously arose from the ashes of Auschwitz where my parents survived to recreate the beautiful state of Israel. That is really the lesson of our history, that the indomitable spirit of the Jews, with our belief in ourselves and our culture and our talent and our Torah and in Almighty God, we can never be destroyed, for God promised we would be an eternal people. So the miracle of a Jewish state, yes, <laughs> due to another miraculous victory against great odds, a victory over 40 million Arabs where the Jews were vastly outnumbered and outarmed, and yet overcame and defeated those who would destroy us. So there's been many, many miracles we've experienced, and there'll be more. Even recently, who would have believed, who would have believed that even though Israel was David and the huge Arab world was the Goliath, Israel would win the wars in 48, 56, 67, and 73. It's a miracle. And who would have believed that Israel, which began with 600,000 Jews in 48, 75 years later, now has seven million Jews in the state of Israel. Half the Jews of the world. It's a miracle. <laughs> Who would have believed that Israel, which only represented 6% of the Jewish world in 48, now represents 50% of the Jewish world? Who would have believed that, and this one's extraordinary, that Israel would have made the desert bloom just as the Holy Bible promised. The Torah says the Holy Land will remain barren until the Jews return. And that's just what happened. <laughs> now... If people wrote the Bible, they would never write that the land will remain barren. Because if things start growing productively, you can throw the Bible out the window. It's a lie. Only God who controls history would write this. Because he controls what happens. And that's what happens. The story of Gaza is proof of this. The Arabs told the Israelis who were moving into Gaza, this is an accursed land. Nothing grows here. But the Jews, for the Jews, it began to yield fruits, flowers, and plants. The tiny portion of land that Gaza yielded at one time most of the agriculture exports of Israel. When, but when the Jews left, when they were thrown out by Sharon, this terrible mistake, and by the way, that was one of the very few votes we have in the umbrella group, this conference of presidents, the 51 Jewish groups. We had a debate. I led the debate on the side not to throw the Jews out. And we had a vote after the debate. Mort Zuckerman was on the side to support throwing the Jews out because it'll bring peace, uh, he said. The vote was 50 to 1. ZOA was the only Jewish organization that voted against the Gaza withdrawal. Every single Jewish group, uh, from Orthodox to right wing to left wing, they all voted in support of throwing the Jews out of Gaza. <laughs> and when the Jews left Gaza, the land, which used to produce extraordinary fruits and vegetables, became useless again. Even the insects participated. The vegetables were famously bug-free under the Jews. Now they began to develop bugs. The thriving businesses of Gaza languished in the hands of the Arabs. Even the same managers who worked under the Jews had all the expertise to make it go, couldn't do it. The land did not cooperate because God controls history. If you need a reason 
to keep Shabbos and Kashrut, it's this. There must be a God. Nothing else explains what I just said. And by the way, the land remains barren to this day. Nothing grows there. <laughs> and who would believe? We now have more students studying in yeshivas in Israel than at any time in history. Who would believe that Orthodox Jews make up 40% of the officers in the army? Who would believe that for the first time in history, a country would bring black people, Ethiopian Jews, to its shores, not to be slaves, but to be a free and proud people? That country is Israel. And that is extraordinary. <laughs> Who would believe that we now would have relations with Oman, UAE, Saudi Arabia, Sudan, Somalia, Morocco, Turkey? I, mean, I just came from meetings with uh, Erdogan in Turkey. I was just there. Uh, not the most wonderful man I ever met, I might add. <laughs> <laughs> they fly the Israeli flags over athletic events in these countries. Uh, it's a miracle. And in 2008, when the world's economy was collapsing, including America's, Israel's economy was flourishing maybe the only one in the world. It's really a miracle. And who would believe that after 2,000 years of dispersion, there are now over a half a million Jews in the holy city of Jerusalem, 450,000 Jews in the holy land of Yehud and Shimon in the West Bank, given to the Jewish people by the Lord our God, King of the universe. And after 2,000 years, we Jews have sovereignty over all of the historically holy Jewish city of Jerusalem, never to be divided again. <laughs> 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 if the statistics are right, the Jews, Mark Twain wrote this, constitute but one quarter of one percent of the human race. Twain said, it suggests a nebulous puff of stardust lost in the blaze of the Milky Way. Properly, the Jew would hardly be heard of, but he is heard of. He's always been heard of. He is as prominent on the planet as any other people, and his importance is extravagantly out of proportion to the smallness of his numbers. His contributions to the world's list of great names in literature, science, art, music, finance, medicine, abstruse, complicated learning are out of proportion to the weakness of the Jews' numbers. He's made a marvelous fight in this world in all ages, has done it with his hand tied behind him. He could be vain of himself and be excused for it. <laughs> Many of the Muslim countries and other countries filled the planet with sound and splendor, then faded to dream stuff and passed away. The Greeks and Romans followed, made a vast noise, they were gone. Other people have sprung up, held their torch high for a time, but it burned out. They sit in twilight and have vanished. The Jewish people saw them all, said Twain, survived them all, is now what he always was, exhibiting no decadence, no infirmities of age, no weakening of his parts, no slowing of his energies, no dulling of his alert but aggressive mind. All things are mortal but the Jews. All other forces pass, but he remains. What is the secret of his immortality? Our holy Torah promises that we are an eternal people never to be destroyed. <laughs> <laughs> in every generation, as the Passover Haggadah foresees, enemies will rise up as they're doing today against the Jewish people. But each time, we Jews will overcome our enemies and we will prevail. We have always emerged to rebuild and become stronger than before. In future years, there will be a time of regeneration, hope, new opportunities, stronger Jewish communities in Eretz Yisrael. The Torah promises that Israel is the Jewish homeland, and that it will always be the Jewish homeland, and that the Jewish people was promised by God Almighty to be an eternal people. And unlike most politicians, God keeps his promises. Thank you very, very much. <laughs> <laughs>